delighted to be with you and see some familiar faces as um, I've given these talks around the county over the years. Uh, there's always a loyal group who tends to come and I appreciate the fact that, that you're here. Um, and uh, I was watching this morning, of course, uh, a lot of the news uh, in the middle of the night, uh, the budget uh, was, was approved and a lot of focus on, on Speaker Ryan and his attempts uh, successful to get the budget through. But of course, uh, I go back a long time and I covered Congress for many years for the New York Times in the 1980s when the speaker was Thomas P. Tip O'Neill. And so in my world, in my memory, the speaker, Mr. Speaker is Mr. O'Neill, uh, not Mr. Ryan. This is not a partisan comment, it's simply a function of my age. Since I'm actually turning 75 in two days, um, uh, you can uh, understand I've been around a while. So, but I gotta tell you Tip O'Neill's favorite joke. Right, Tip O'Neill's favorite joke. He used to tell us all the time. And uh, this great and good man um, uh, dies and goes to heaven. He meets St. Peter and, and St. Peter says, well, son, you've been such a loyal uh, servant of the church. We want to uh, grant you any wish that you would like. And he says, well, you know, really, I want to meet the Virgin Mother. I want to meet Mary because there's a question I've always wanted to ask her. St. Peter says, well, sure, we can arrange that. And ushers him into the presence of the uh, Holy Mother. And she says, son, you have a question for me? He says, yes. He said, you know, all those years when I saw you in those paintings, and particularly in those statues when you were holding the infant Jesus, you always looked so sad. I, I could never figure out why were you so sad? She looks at him and says, I wanted a girl. Uh, <laughs> tip. Tip O'Neill's favorite joke. It has a certain resonance, right, these days? <laughs> um, so uh, I've asked to talk about uh, President Trump a year later. And please understand, I'm here as an analyst, not as an advocate. I know many of you have strong feelings. You're entitled to those feelings. I have strong feelings, too. But that's not why I'm here. I'm here to try to help us understand what's going on. And that's the spirit in which I, I appear here, not as an advocate or not as a uh, as a partisan for any cause. Uh, and uh, let's start with a couple of numbers. Uh, in fact, I noticed yesterday uh, the uh, Gallup poll, which of course uh, does uh, huge surveys, uh, averaged up all of the surveys that they've taken for the entire year in every state asking a favorable rating of President Trump. And they came up with one number which um, was the number that this is the average of all of the polls everywhere for an entire year. And actually, to no one's surprise, if you've been following this at all, the number was 38. Um, that is the average of all of the polls all year in terms of President Trump's favorable rating. Now, as I'm sure all of you know, this is historically low uh, in the first year of any presidency. It's 15 or 20 points lower than most presidents in their first year. And our polling data goes back to about the mid-50s. That's where modern polling really began. So we don't have historical data before that. But going back to the times when Gallup and others, uh, Lou Harris and others, pioneered the profession of modern polling, this is historically low. But uh, let's remember, uh, President Trump has always been, from the beginning, a main minority president. He got 46% of the vote. It was enough to win because of where those 46 were distributed in key <laughs> states. We do know that, of course, that uh, Hillary Clinton actually won the popular vote. But she won the popular vote entirely on the basis of her surplus in California. If you take California out of the mix, Trump won the popular vote, which is one of the problems for Democrats, which is that they waste a lot of votes. There, and this is a natural selection process, but the fact is you can run up millions of votes in the margin in California and New York, and still um, you're wasting a lot of those votes. So when people say, well, Clinton won the popular vote, that's true, and it has a certain meaning, but that meaning is tempered by the fact that it was entirely in one state that, provided, that produced that, that margin. She won California by, I think, three million votes or more. So, but that doesn't negate the fact that Donald Trump is a minority president, given the fact that he won 46% of, uh, of the vote. And this status has been persistent and consistent throughout the entire first year of his presidency. These numbers of favorable ratings have fluctuated, but not very much. 
The fact is they've fluctuated within a rather narrow band of somewhere between about 35% and 40%. Today, they're on the upper edge of that range, partly because we're in the aftermath of the State of the Union address, the successful tax bill. But uh, by and large, that's where uh, Trump is. And, and when you talk about the core base of Trump's support, that's what it is. It's somewhere between 35 and 40 percent of the American electorate. Now, some analysts say it's lower than that, um, uh, including some Republicans say that if you really want to reduce it to the core, most fervent loyalists, and they look at some other questions. For instance, if you look at a question, do you think President Trump has the temperament to be president? It drops below that. So there are uh, some analysts who say the real hardcore Trump support is about 25 percent, not 35 or 38 percent. But whatever metric you use, whatever perspective you have, what we do know, it's a minority of America. And we do know that President Trump has very seldom tried to expand beyond that base. Uh, over and over again, his, po his po political statements, his positions uh, have been aimed at energizing and solidifying that base rather than reaching beyond it, which is one of the key reasons why those numbers have stayed so static in the course of a year. He's made very little attempt to broaden those numbers and had very little success at broadening those numbers. There is that core base of support. Now, if you look inside that base of support, it's very interesting because actually when you look at certain issues or policies, Trump does a little better than that, particularly on the economy. Now look, every president in the history of the world has taken more credit for a good economy than he deserves. And every president in the history of the world gets more blame for a bad economy than he deserves. The truth is that a president can only affect economics on the margins. The economy is this enormous engine that goes on and it, it is a, a function of billions of individual decisions made every day investment decisions and sales decisions and buying decisions. In fact, uh, among the government, the agency, of course, has the biggest effect on the economy. It's not under the president's control at all. It's, it's the Federal Reserve. Now, he can name the head of the Federal Reserve, as he has, by replacing Janet Yellen with Jay Powell, but the, who is, by the way, a Montgomery County kid, Jay Powell, went to Georgetown Prep High School, uh, as did Neil Gorsuch. Uh, both went to the same high school. Uh, and. Um, so it's a, um, uh, so the president, but the president uh, takes credit and with some justification, because frankly, if it was a Democrat in office with this good economy, Democrat would take the same credit without the same, you know, and, and really would not be justified in doing it in many ways. But the fact is, if you, apart from the last couple of days of extraordinary volatility in the stock market, over the first year of Trump's presidency, any fair-minded assessment has got to say that the economy has done pretty well. Not only had the stock market, I mean, look at your 401ks, you know, they've taken a hit in the last couple of days, but up until the last week, they've been pretty good. Inflation has been very much under control, very much under control. Um, and uh, unemployment is at rock bottom. It's at just 4.1, 4.2, uh, lowest in, 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 in many, many years. And interestingly enough, you got to admit this, that for the first time in many years, there's been a slow increase in real wages because the great dead weight during the Obama years, the, the great failure economically during the Obama years was to generate any increase in wages. There was reasonably good unemployment numbers, but wages were static. And even with low in inflation, that meant that a lot of families were actually falling behind. Wages were not even keeping up with inflation, even though inflation was pretty much under control. But even so, they were falling behind. And that clearly was one of the reasons why Trump won because an awful lot of families just felt that stagnation, felt that they were not getting ahead and their kids were not getting ahead. So the fact that wages are starting to creep upward is a good sign for America. It's a good sign for a lot of working families here in Montgomery County and anywhere, and we just got to acknowledge that. Now, does Trump, was it Trump policies that created that? Well, probably not. Um, you know, and a lot of Democrats will complain and say, really, it was Obama policies that are now coming to fruition. I understand that argument. Bottom line is, the economy is getting better. We see how the stock market breaks in the next few weeks. But by and large, the economy is getting better. And the numbers, uh, Trump's numbers, reflect that. 
because when you ask people, do you approve of Trump's handling of the economy, it's up into the 40s. That is the highest score he gets on any issue, is handling of the economy. So uh, if, we, if we're making a scorecard here, um, that has got to be one of the areas where Trump uh, takes credit and gets credit from the voters. Now, we could also dig into the fact that, and of course right now, as I say, he's also gotten a boost, not only because the uh, tax bill passed, but because there are short-term tangible benefits from the tax bill. People are going to start uh, uh, seeing a, a, a certain increase in their paychecks. Withholding is going to go down a little bit for some families. Um, we've had these highly publicized examples of corporations which have said, well, now we're going to pay less uh, taxes, we're going to give bonuses, and of course, the Trump campaign, Trump administration has publicized those issues, as they have a right to do. Um, and so there is a, a certain feeling in the country that the tax bill is benefiting ordinary people. Now, a lot of economists have raised, of course, enormous warning signs about this bill, that it's a short-term sugar high and a long-term uh, very, potentially very damaging. Because if you look at the way the tax bill is structured, um, a lot of the revenue losses are going to kick in over a period of time. In fact, uh, all independent economists agree that the deficit, the, 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 the amount of money this tax bill is going to add to the deficit is $1.5 trillion. That's a T, trillion dollars. That's a lot of money, even in Washington. Now, Proponents of the tax bill will argue that it will generate enough economic activity and revenue to pay for itself. We have heard this song a long time. You go back to Reagan, that's a, almost word for word what we heard from the Reagan administration in their tax bills in the early 80s. Every independent economist I have consulted and everything I have ever read, apart from partisanship, comes to pretty much the same conclusion, which is that yes, Tax cuts, if done right, can generate economic activity, but they will never pay for the full cost of the tax bill. They will pay, if things go really right, somewhere between a quarter and a third of the cost. So that if, whether it's a Democrat or Republican, we tend to hear this more from the Republicans, tax bill is going to pay for itself, don't believe it. Because every economist, conservatives, uh, liberals, apart from this small sliver of, you know, you rem might remember the name Arthur Laffer and the Laffer curve from the Reagan years. This was the, the fantasy that somehow these cuts were all going to pay for themselves. It has never happened. It does have a short-term economic benefit. There are benefits you can point to. There are, uh, it, there are incentives for investment. There are incentives for raising pay. It would be wrong to say that a tax cut has no economic benefit. But the best uh, estimate of independent, fair-minded economists is that we're talking about somewhere between about a quarter and a third of the cost of a tax cut can be paid for by the generation of revenue. So down the line, of course, we're looking at, a, at an enormous increase in the federal deficit. One of the most interesting things that's happened in the first year of the Trump administration, and you saw it play out just this week, was the almost total abandonment by Republicans of fiscal discipline. A whole generation of Republicans who came to Washington saying, smaller government, lower taxes, reduce the deficit, balance the budget. There were Republicans who ran on, let's have a constitutional amendment to, ban to balance the budget. And not only did they just pass a tax bill, which cost one and a half trillion dollars, they just passed a budget last night in the middle of the night that is going to add vast amounts of money to the deficit by increasing military spending by a huge amount, $80 billion, and domestic spending, because that was the price of the Democrat support, about $63 billion. So one thing we can say about the first year of the Trump administration is that fiscal discipline has almost totally disappeared in Washington. Now, there are arguments on both sides. There were people who say, well, at times the Democrats have argued deficit spending is a good thing, that it primes the pump, that it generates economic activity. But the real problem with long-range deficits, with, with huge deficits, is that they, um, they choke off economic growth. One of the things about a tax bill, you can say, well, it has short-term stimulus effect, but the long-term effect is counter uh, to economic growth because of the rise of interest payments. 
Because when you have that huge deficit, that means that the, the interest you pay on that debt as a share of the annual budget keeps going up, which means that you have, you're squeezing the amount of money that's available for other programs. So uh, you, you, but short term, uh, you know, the easiest thing that Washington does is spend money. And so you had this agreement hammered out by Republican and Democratic leaders. Uh, President Trump has said he's going to sign it. Um, that is going to add enormous amounts to the deficit. There was, for a couple of years, some fiscal discipline built into the budget process. This strange phrase you've heard over and over, sequester. But what sequester meant, really, there were kind of budget caps since about 2011. They've been pretty rigid. Congress has been desperate to break those caps for years. They now finally have done it. Oddly enough, under someone who you know, was a ostensibly a conservative Republican president, under a liberal Democratic president, those caps <laughs> actually kept, um, kept in place. But this year, they've just been busted wide open with the vote last night. For those of you who didn't hear, the bill was passed by the Senate around 2 o'clock. It was passed by the House around 5 o'clock this morning, with a much larger margin, by the way, than people expected. Uh, there was a thought that with Nancy Pelosi uh, opposing the bill because she was uh, demanding uh, action on the Dreamers, the uh, young uh, um, uh, immigrants brought here illegally as kids, that uh, some liberal Democrats would defect and that some Republicans who still believe in fiscal discipline would defect and that there was some th thought that en enough defectors might sink this bill, but in fact it passed pretty easily about, I forget the number, about like 240 to 180, something like that. So uh, uh, the first thing I, I, I want to say is on the, on the area of, 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 of economics in the first year of the president, this is probably and has been most successful area of policy and the one that the public appreciates the most, whether it's going to come back to bite us in the long run with these deficits, another question. Right now, it's popular. Second thing that I think um, uh, you hear a lot from Team Trump in terms of uh, boasting about their achievements in the first year is the federal judiciary. You have to start with Neil Gorsuch, uh, the new Supreme Court Justice. As I say, by the way, uh, Neil is a graduate of Georgetown Prep right down Rockville Pike here, um, just a few miles. In fact, uh, my son was a year behind him at Georgetown Prep. Um, and the first time I heard the name Neil Gorsuch was 30 years ago when uh, my son was a junior and he was a senior and they were on the debate team at Georgetown <laughs> Prep together. And I, I said to my, my son, whatever happened to that Gorsuch fellow? Um, uh, <laughs> and you got to say, whether you approve it or not, McConnell, Mitch McConnell's strategy of thwarting Obama's appointment of uh, Merrick Garland, as, uh, as, as devious as that might seem to many of us, uh, was successful. It did keep the seat open. It allowed uh, uh, Trump to make the, a critical appointment. Now, we all know that uh, because he was replacing a conservative, it didn't change the most basic balance in the Supreme Court. Um, and for those of you who care about the Supreme Court, I suggest you um, light a candle for the health of Ruth Ginsburg. But um, uh, I, I do think that um, uh, this is a very significant achievement. It would be for any president, but particularly for a conservative Republican. If you think about the issues that the conservative base of the Republican Party really care about, many of them do come up before the Supreme Court. Um, and more so than some of the issues that the liberals care about. Sure, there are issues liberals care about. I'm, I'm not saying that they don't. But the very nature of, of issues that involve religious uh, practices and religious values tend to be more important to the conservatives and the evangelical Christian community than to the liberal community. And if you go back in the campaign, sure, Hillary Clinton talked about federal judges too. But Trump smartly used the issue of who gets to fill that Supreme Court seat as a much more significant part of his campaign than Clinton did, because it, it's an issue that resonates with his conservative base and particularly with his more religious conservative base, the evangelical Christian base, which is a very significant part of Trump's core base of support whether the issue is abortion, whether the issue is same-sex marriage, whether the issue is religious practices. You saw the case that the court just took. It hasn't ruled on yet about the rights of a baker 
Does the baker have a right to turn down a, a gay couple that wants their services? The Hobby Lobby case, where we got into the question of, uh, of health insurance and, and uh, does health insurance have to provide coverage for certain medical practices that the, a, a, a conservative Christian company doesn't support, right? The, all those kinds of issues uh, come before the court and are of enormous importance to the core base of the Republican Party. And so um, uh, that issue resonates with the base. It was one of the, if, if you go back and, and listen to voters during the campaign, there were a significant number of voters who, in being interviewed, said, well, I don't like Donald Trump, I don't trust him, but he's going to appoint better justices than Hillary Clinton. That was a, and, and of course that issue was highlighted by the fact that there was an open seat. So this was not an abstract question. This was the most tangible result of the election. And the most obvious consequence of the election was who got to fill that seat. And so that was an asset to Trump in mobilizing the conservative Christian base of the party because it was such a visible symbol of the consequences of the election. And you can say a lot of things about President Trump and a lot of things people didn't like, but they overcame a lot of those doubts because of that. But it's not just the Supreme Court. As many of you, of course, know, any president gets to appoint dozens and dozens of lower court justices. And the fact is that the Republicans kind of slow walked Obama in the last couple of years. And so it's not just that the Supreme Court seat was open, but there are a lot of other uh, appellate and district court seats that have been left open as well. And given the fact that Republicans control the Senate um, and they uh, have uh, taken a number of steps uh, to facilitate the judicial process, there's an ancient practice which Republicans abrogated called a blue slip. And what that means is that um, senators uh, really got to sign off on judges appointed to courts that covered their state. And it was an informal process, but it was dispositive. It worked. That meant that if you were a Democratic senator, you were Sherrod Brown in Ohio, and there was a district judge you didn't like who was appointed in Ohio, you could pretty much block it. No more. One of the things the Republicans have done is eliminate the blue slip practice. Now, that's going to come back to bite them eventually. Because when they're in the minority some year, and they are going to find a Democratic president appointing judges they don't like, it's going to come back to bite them. But no one ever thinks about that. No one ever thinks about the consequences of changing the rules about someday we might be in the minority. I mean, this happened to the Democrats when they changed the filibuster rules. You know? so, but for now, uh, this is the second area where I think uh, Trump uh, has been successful in uh, nominating uh, judges to the lower courts, and they have been processed at a fairly rapid pace by uh, the D Republican-controlled Senate because they have changed the practices to facilitate it and uh, eliminate some of the few roadblocks that Democrats can put up. Now, this is of enormous long-term consequence. You could even argue that in, the, in many cases, the most lasting mark any president makes is who he appoints to the judiciary. I covered Ronald Reagan and covered the Congress during the first years of Reagan, and Reagan did something very conscious and very smart. Not only did he uh, appoint a lot of very conservative judges, but he appointed young conservative judges. <laughs> And that meant that today, a generation after Ronald Reagan left the scene, he still has a significant imprint on the federal judiciary. People he appointed in their 40s are now in their 70s, and they're still serving. So this is a very significant dimension. People don't focus on this, but when you talk about the consequences of an election, this is right at the top of the list. And Trump has allied with a group called the Federalist Society, which is a group of conservative jurists and lawyers who have spent a lot of time preparing lists and vetting candidates so that the day Trump came into office, the Federalist Society had a list of conservative judicial candidates ready for him to approve. And so therefore, he has been able to put through in his first year a significant, fill in a significant number of those seats. So that would be the second area where I think in any accounting of of the, of the Trump record, where from their point of view, they have been successful, filling the Supreme Court, but also these lower level seats. 
Third area where I think that, uh, and this is less visible to the naked eye, but it's really happening more under the radar than anything else, is regulatory changes. One of the single most powerful um, tools that any president has has nothing to do with legislation. It has to do with changing regulations, canceling regulations, modifying regulations, changing the interpretation of regulations. There have been some visible examples of that, most notably in the area of conservation, where Trump reversed the, you know, certain decisions of, of, of Obama about protection of certain federal lands, Bears ear, Bears Ears, a particularly odd name for a, a federal uh, a wildlife refuge, but they eliminated about 80, 90 percent of that federal um, protection to allow for mining. And that the, happens that the area that had been under federal protection and is no longer is one of the few sources of uranium um, in the country. And so this is now open for mining when it was not under Obama. And you saw, for instance, the issue of offshore drilling, um, where uh, uh, Trump made the decision to allow uh, offshore drilling in areas that had been banned by Obama. And now, there was a blowback from the local states, and there was this very odd circumstance where the governor of Florida objected, and they said, okay, we're not going to do Florida. And the governors of states like South Carolina, where truth and labeling, I happen to own a little piece of beachfront property. Um, uh, I'm very happy to say that the South Carolina government just is furious about this. I don't want to look at it in oil, Derek. Um, but um, th this is only the tip of the proverbial iceberg, because there are many, many areas environmental areas, uh, fiscal regulation. When you look at some of the uh, watchdog agencies and rules that were created by Dodd-Frank to watch over financial institutions have been abrogated by this administration. Um, environmental uh, pollution controls, whole coal industry. The president at the, um, at the State of the Union boasted about rolling back clean air regulations related to the coal industry. So. You, you, this is a very significant dimension of any assessment of the first year of Trump. You have to look under the surface and look at the, the regulatory environment in which he was able to make a mark. And one of the reasons he was able to do that is he appointed very, very conservative critics in many of these areas. I mean, uh, he appointed, you know, as, you know, to the Secretary of Energy, Secretary of the Interior, uh, people who have been long-time critics of these agencies and the regulatory regimes that they embodied. And this was very deliberate, and this was very calculated, to use the power of the president to, on the regulatory front, to roll back. I mean, look, this is the way the system works. The Democrats win, and they get to impose certain regulations, and they lose. Republicans get to reverse them. And of course, the reverse is true, too. And that's one of the consequences of elections. Uh, and, and a consequence that doesn't get enough attention and is not as visible because it's not subject to the legislative process, it's not subject to filibusters, you don't hear a lot of speeches about it, but uh, if you know anybody, grandchildren in the regulatory world, they will tell you that one of the biggest impacts in the first year of the Trump administration has been on regulatory uh, issues, and particularly in those areas, um, uh, environmental concerns, uh, pollution control, financial regulations. These are the three of the areas. There are others, but those are three that have been at the top of the Trump hit list and where he's made the biggest impact. Let me turn to, um, uh, to some of the weaknesses uh, uh, that have uh, appeared in, in, in the first year. One of the things that has really struck me is that Trump has failed to alleviate a lot of the doubts even some of his supporters have about his temperament and character. If you go back to the election, I, I've done this very carefully, it's fascinating. In the exit polls, and of course exit polls are enormously valuable sources of information, they're much better than weekly polls, because the database is huge. And all political scientists and political reporters use uh, the, uh, the exit polls in presidential elections as particularly valuable valuable sources of data about the nature of the electorate because the, the base is so wide and the data is, is so much more fine-grained. You can break it down into much smaller groups. You can't, for instance, in a, in a uh, ordinary national poll, which is 1,200 people, you don't have enough single 
black women to say a lot, but in a national, in an exit poll, you have enough to be able to have much richer sense of groups like that. Anyway, one of the things that struck me in going back, and I noticed it at the time, and I went back to remind myself. When people were asked questions like, do you think Trump has the temperament to be president? Does he have the character to be president? Is he honest and trustworthy? Questions like that. In every case, more than 60% of voters said no. However, somewhere between 15 and 20% of the voters who answered no to all of those questions voted for him. That was the difference in the election. It was that margin of people who doubted his character but voted for him anyway. Now, there are, each one had their own reasons. Some of it was simply tribal identification with the Republican Party. Some of it was issues that I've already described, like the Supreme Court or tax reform. Um, some of it was um, uh, a deep-seated and an abiding resentment of Hillary Clinton. And any fair-minded assessment of, of that election has got to acknowledge that in the end she turned out to be a terrible candidate and that um, virtually any other Democrat probably would have beaten Donald Trump. But one of the key reasons why that critical margin, right? Polit American politics has played along the margins. You know, about 80% of the people are going to vote the same way every election. And there are relatively few swing people in swing states, but this group that had these deep-seated doubts but still voted for Trump and put him over the line in the key states in places like Michigan and Ohio, one of the key reasons we know was that they simply could not abide Mrs. Clinton, couldn't stomach the notion of a second Clinton presidency and all that went with the baggage that she, she lugged behind her. So for all of those reasons, you now have a very odd situation where you have a president uh, who uh, still suffers severely from these doubts and questions by a majority of the American people. And in the course of the first year, he has not changed those minds. All the polling shows that all of the doubts that were there on election day 2016 are still there. If you ask a question today, do you think that Donald Trump is an honest and trustworthy person? The doubts are as high as they were on election day. So one of the takeaways of the first year of the Trump administration is, for a whole variety of reasons, he has failed to alleviate the doubts about his character, temperament, and trustworthiness that plagued him from the beginning of his political career. In fact, in some ways you could say it actually is worse. Because, you know, when he says things like, I have a bigger button than the president of North Korea, this, you know, as a candidate, people's alarms or fears were sort of in the abstract. Now they're a little more tangible um, and, and, and a little more directly threatening. So if anything, I think in some ways doubts about his character have actually grown. Uh, but they certainly have not gotten better. Um, but one of the reasons they haven't gotten better is he really hasn't really tried. As I said earlier, if you look at issue after issue, time after time, he has chosen to appeal to the core base of his support and not tried to alleviate these questions. One of the chief mechanisms that has continued to foment these doubts about his judgment and temperament is the way he communicates. Now, it's easy to talk about Twitter, but you really have to dig into Twitter because it's a very significant dimension of the Trump presidency. And it was a very significant dimension of the Trump candidacy. Donald Trump said many times in the course of the campaign and in interviews after the election that I would not be president without Twitter. I think he's right. The only way to think about how Donald Trump communicates is to realize that he has his own broadcasting network. The TBN, the Trump Broadcasting Network. And fact is, its audience is a lot bigger than NPR and a lot bigger than ABC. Now, Barack Obama had the OBN. He pioneered a lot of this. Trump did not invent the internet. Al Gore invented the internet. Trump did not invent the internet. He didn't invent the use of the internet as a political tool. Obama was very deft with it and very pioneering and very successful at it. But Trump has taken it to a new level. Uh, for Obama, it was part of a much larger communication strategy. 
For Trump, it is his main communication strategy. Um, and I don't know what his number of Twitter followers now is up well into about 30 million or more. But you have to understand the nature of this means of communication. First of all, he is in total command of it. He's command of the message within the space. He's command of the timing. He's command of the audience. You know, when I covered the White House, uh, uh, you know, an eon ago, when Ronald Reagan was president, on a, in a basic way, Ronald Reagan needed the press corps. He was a great communicator, but he needed the press as his transmission belt, as his platform. Donald Trump, in a basic way, does not need the press anymore, and he's been very explicit about that. And in fact, in the first months of the Trump administration we had at GW, where I teach at School of Media and Public Affairs, we had Sean, the late Sean Spicer uh, to, to speak. Um, and he was on a panel with a bunch of other, with a bunch of journalists. And he basically, he was a pretty nasty guy. And he kind of looked at him and said, he said, it we don't need you. New game in town. We don't need you. We have our own ways of communicating directly. We don't need you. And the fact is that Donald Trump has not held a full dress live press conference in front of the press corps in almost a year. The last time he held it was February, a year ago. Because he doesn't feel he needs to. Ronald Reagan had to. Ronald Reagan needed to face the press as a way of communicating. Donald Trump does not. Now, in some ways, of course, this is an enormous asset. Because you can't, you, you got to think of the viral potential here. It's not as if Trump is just speaking to his 30 million followers. But each one of those 30 million followers is also a potential broadcaster, also a potential transmission belt, also a potential disseminator of information because they can then retweet and repost these messages to their own networks and followers, right? So immediately you can see the enormous viral impact. Plus, of course, Trump has learned that the mainstream media will always follow what he says. He understands the nature of Twitter very, very well. It is not possible to say anything intelligent in 140 characters. It is impossible to do that. But he's not trying to do that. What he's trying to do is being incendiary. What he's trying to do is be noticed. What he's trying to do is shake things, be disruptive. And to do that, you have to be edgy, you have to be nasty, you have to be noticeable, and that's exactly what he does on Twitter. And so, it serves his purposes very well because his base gets energized and they retweet what he says and Sean Hannity on Fox retweet, uh, uh, repeats it or the president tweets what he heard on Fox and Friends in the morning. It's this, it's this feedback loop between Fox and the president and they're all speaking to each other in this echo chamber and the base is supported, the 38% as I said, is cheering for it and it works. What it doesn't do is broaden the base. What it doesn't do is reach beyond uh, that echo chamber of, of Trumpian, Foxian uh, listeners. Uh, but for Trump's strategy, he doesn't really care about that. And within this world, within this ecosystem, this, the TBN is brilliant. It's brilliant and very successful, but it has a downside. And one of the downsides is the very language, the very attitude that is edgy enough to get retweeted and reposted, that is nasty enough to have his core supporters jumping to their feet screaming, is alienating everybody else. That's why those numbers about character haven't moved. That's why a majority of Americans still have these doubts, because in his attempt to energize and solidify his base, he continues to foment these questions people have about his judgment and character. So when he tweets, I've got a bigger button than Kim Il Jung, people say, yeah, right, go get him, Donald. But two-thirds of Americans are scared to death. So that's one of the key things to take away from the first year, that he has consistently placed his priorities on solidifying and energizing the base, and the cost has been significant. The cost has been significant in preserving and fostering those doubts that people have about him. Now, another area which is right in front of us right now, I saw I was passing a 
TV monitor in the uh, hallway of my building this morning, and Trump apparently said something about, okay, negotiations about immigrants start now. Now, on the issue of immigration, I think Trump has played a particularly devious game. Let's remember how Donald Trump came to prominence in American politics. And that was as an advocate of the birther movement. The idea that Barack Obama was a closet Muslim and born in Kenya and, and not a legitimate American. Any fair, independent assessment of the birther movement has to acknowledge there was a significant streak of racism right down the middle of that idea. Because it wasn't just he was a Muslim and he was from Kenya. He was a black man. He was a man of color and he was an alien. He was an other. He wasn't one of us. And um, that's how he came to prominence. And you all know, you know, the moments when he's reinforced those doubts. You know, he chose on the day he um, uh, announced for president to call Mexican immigrants rapists. He chose to propose a ban on all Muslims coming into the country. He chose just a few weeks ago, in his State of the Union address, when he spoke about immigrants, who did he choose to speak about? Gang members and terrorists. Every one of us here in Montgomery County, every one of us who knows anything about Montgomery College, knows that every single day our lives are enriched and, 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 and revitalized and made better by the presence of immigrants in this community. Every one of us knows that. And yet, where in the balcony was the nurse in, in Gaithersburg Hospital who works the night shift and, and, and keeps that hospital running every day? Nobody like that was in the balcony. Nobody like that was identified because his whole approach to, to immigrants has been to demonize them and to say, I'm going to defend you and protect you, those two words which he used repeatedly. I'm going to defend you and protect you from these alien invaders. But that has been also at the core of his political success. Because again, it goes back to my main point. He isn't speaking to all of Americans. He's speaking to a sliver of Americans, a core of Americans, which have been his most loyal supporters. Now, some of you heard me talk about immigration before. It's a hot button issue of mine. I've written two books about it. I use my column. Uh, Natasha didn't mention that I write a column for Bethesda Magazine, which some of you know, which um, I use very deliberately to try to reflect the diversity of this county. And in fact, one of the other talks I give for, I've gi I gave it last year here at Montgomery, I think, my, even in this room, I think, um, on uh, the diversity and the changing face of Montgomery County. So this is something I care very deeply about. But I was appalled at this, uh, at this speech because it continued to, to the extent that he mentioned immigrants, it was all negative. Now, one of the, it works politically, but it's crazy in a way that it works politically. Because the group that would benefit the most from increased legal immigration to America, of course, Trump is also wants to cut not just illegal immigration, but cut in half legal immigration which is now about a million people a year. The group that would most profit economically from more legal immigration, Trump's core supporters, aging white men. Who is going to pay the taxes to pay the, for the social services that all those Trump supporters are going to need as they retire from the workplace? Immigrants. The projection by the Pew Research Center about the growth in our workforce over the next generation is that 88% of the growth in the American workforce will come from immigrants. 88%. As Fred Hyatt, many of you may perhaps saw Fred's editorial page out of the Washington Post, wrote a piece, an editorial the other day saying, if we cut off legal immigration, we become Japan. An aging society that is, 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 is creaking and groaning and collapsing under the weight of a totally misshapen population, of a, an aging population, a shrinking workforce, which can't begin to pay the taxes that are going to support the long-term economic uh, health and, and welfare benefits that have been promised to these retiring workers. We become Italy, a country with the lowest birth rate in the world. Right? 
one of the great secrets of the success of the American economy has been this steady infusion of young, hardworking, taxpaying immigrants. And we see it here in this county every day. Many of you know that if you take the census definition of non-Hispanic white, it's an odd definition. Non-Hispanic white, Montgomery County, 46%. That's all. Montgomery County is a third foreign born today. 40% of the people in Montgomery County speak a language other than English at home. That's where the vitality is coming from. That's where the growth is coming from. That's where the, the economic engines are coming from in this county and all over this country. If you look at some of the aging cities in America, Cleveland, Detroit, they are desperately pleading for immigrants to come move into the neighborhoods that the Jews and the Italians and the Irish and the Poles used to live in. They're all in the suburbs. They're all in Gaithersburg and Rockville or Bethesda. But if you're in the functional equivalent of Detroit, you're in St. Louis, you know who's lives in all the old Italian houses in St. Louis? Bosnians. There are 30,000 Bosnians, all of whom moved into the old Italian neighborhood and have revitalized it. And every city in this country understands that that's the lifeblood. It's absolutely essential. So the oddity of Trump's opposition to immigration is it's totally self-defeating for the very people who voted for him. But try telling them that. Try explaining them that. It just falls on deaf ears. But immigration is a hot button for me, but it is the area where I think it's fair to be most critical of Trump because it's been devious, it's been cynical, it's been raising the darkest and deepest fears people have, and by his own self-interest of his own followers, it's self-defeating. Now, we also have to admit that Donald Trump is a very American figure. Because if you look at the history of immigration in this country, and I have because I've written two books about it, Trump, there have been Trumps throughout our history. In the 1840s, there was a political party in this country that went by the know-nothings whose main plank was anti-Catholicism, mainly anti-Irish, but to some extent German. In the 1880s, we passed laws in this country barring Chinese from owning property in this country. Early part of the 20th century, a lot of the focus was on anti-Semitism and anti-Italian. There were places in this country where Italians were, were discriminated against as non-white. There were, there were lynchings of Italians in this country. There were prosecutions of, of Sacco and Vanzetti and, 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 and the red scares of Italians were. The subversives, to say nothing of 140,000 loyal Japanese Americans were interned during World War II. So this is not new. I wish it were, but it's not. So this is part of Trump's first year. He has continued to, to play that song, continued to play on those fears, um, and, uh, and to continue to be divisive and using this as a political tool. And he keeps saying, I love the dreamers, and, you know, but he keeps poisoning the well for any real negotiation. Now, again, he said today, OK, now I'm going to get serious. We'll see. We'll see. But Part of his problem is, and part of the problem that Republicans in general have, is that their margin in the House of Representatives is, is relatively small, you know, at 24 seats. And they are in, and, and they, um, uh, if you bring to the floor, and this has been true for years now, you bring to the floor an immigration bill that could pass the Senate with Democratic support, will almost certainly be stopped by the conservatives in the House, because margin of only 24 votes. So, We'll see how this plays out. But up till now, I think the takeaway for Trump's first year is that this has been one of the most, uh, one of the greatest failures of leadership, uh, uh, in, in total failure to help solve this problem. Not just the dreamers, but the much larger question of the role immigrants play in American society and the profound misunderstanding about the value whether that misunderstanding is willful or, I, I don't know. But we do know that it is profoundly wrong, not just from a moral point of view, but from the point of view of economic self-interest for this country and for particularly, as I say, for aging supporters. You think about the aging white men who are leaving the white workforce, many of whom, uh, you know, by definition, we know that a, high, a much higher percentage of Trump voters do not have college degrees are on the lower end of the economic spectrum. They're the ones who are going to depend most heavily on these programs. They're the ones who don't have 401ks from their law firms, right? They're the ones who are going to be most 
dependent on Medicare and Social Security. Industrial pensions have virtually disappeared. You look at many of these guys who worked at, you know, it was a terrible, terribly unfair tragedy, but you look at so many of the Trump supporters who once worked at these flourishing uh, manufacturing industries, dependent on, those pensions are gone. Many of those cases, they don't exist at all anymore. The companies have closed, companies have gone offshore, they've canceled the pension rights. What are they gonna depend on? What are they gonna live on? They're gonna live on the taxes paid by immigrants. Pretty self-defeating. Anyway, um, there are many other issues. I haven't really touched foreign and military policy, but why don't I stop there? And um, this is sort of an overview. I'm happy to answer anything that's on anybody's mind here. So, you know, you want to know what Koki's real name? You probably know that already. Uh, <laughs> since uh, she's been around a while, too. Um, as, as many of you know, we, we live in the house that she grew up in on Bradley Boulevard in Bethesda. The house has now been in the family for 66 years. Uh, her parents lived in it for uh, 25, and we've now lived in it for over 40. So we are part of this community. We are part of this neighborhood. Uh, we feel very deeply about it and very loyal to it. So um, you can ask me anything. So fire away. What's on your mind? I wanted to comment on uh, Trump saying, lock her up, lock her up. And then when Michael Flynn, people were hollering, lock him up. So I wanted to know what you thought about that. Well, I think it's a very dangerous, did everybody hear the question? You know, I think it's a very dangerous impulse on both sides to criminalize political behavior. You know, I think that the, the notion, I, I lived and worked in Greece for f close to five years. I covered elections in Europe and Middle East and Turkey, Italy. And there, elections and politics were criminalized. And a party would get elected and the, and the first thing they would do would change the election rules to embed themselves in office and screw the rivals. There was a, a almost total failure to have a common sense of, of a reassurance that there was an independent judiciary, an independent system of laws that protected everybody no matter who was in power. So if you start with locking up your political rivals, uh, as his chant uh, was, I think this is a very, very dangerous idea because part of what has always separated us from other countries is this reassurance on part of everybody that the judicial system was going to be fair and independent of political influence. Now, I think that um, President Trump does not understand that. Again, either willfully or for whatever reason. If you look at how many times he has consciously tried to undermine elements of the judicial and legal system that disagree with him, start with federal judges. You go back even before the election, right, where he had this vicious campaign against this federal judge who was of Mexican origins, mm -hmm. who was ruling in a case involving Trump's business. And he kept, I went up back and looked at this just the other day, and he kept calling him a Mexican and a Hispanic, and that's why he was a lousy judge. The guy was born in Indiana. Parents were from Mexico, but he was born in Indiana. And yet Trump repeatedly attacked him as a disgrace. It was one of his favorite words. He used it again recently, right? You go back and look at, what he said about Judge Curiel, it was almost word for word what he said recently about the federal, about the FBI. They're a disgrace and people should be ashamed of themselves. Almost word for word what he said about, uh, about Judge Curiel a year and a half ago. So I don't think he understands the independence of judges. I don't think he understands the independence of the FBI and the Justice Department. The fact is the FBI and the Justice Department are pretty unusual in the American system. I will not say unique because I tell my students that that word is one of the most misused words in the English language. But it is very unusual because, yes, the president does appoint the head of the FBI. He does appoint the attorney general. But there's a reason why the FBI head is appointed for 10 years. It's to try to abrogate political pressure, to insulate him from political pressure. There's a reason why there's a tradition of US attorneys serving. Rod Rosenstein, who was the uh, deputy attorney general right here in Maryland, served both Democratic and Republican administrations. We had that model right here. Um, if you look at um, uh, uh, the, even the, judici the uh, Justice Department, yes, he appoints the Attorney General, but the Attorney General, by definition in the American system, actually has two roles, two hats, two loyalties. 
He's a member of the president's cabinet, but he's also at the head of an independent judicial and legal process that is immune and insulated from political pressures. So it's, a, it's kind of a hybrid and sometimes difficult to understand, but that's the way it's set up. What I, don't, I think Trump has demonstrated over and over again that he doesn't understand the difference. When he calls in James Comey to the head of the FBI and says, are you going to be loyal to me? And when Comey declines to do that and he fires him, I pre it's a pretty dispositive case. When you look at the fact that he's furious with Jeff Sessions, his own attorney general, because Sessions recused himself from the whole Mueller investigation and didn't uh, appoint a special prosecutor, that says he expects the attorney general to be loyal to him. But that's not how the American system is set up. Yes, look at Kennedy. Kennedy appointed his own brother as attorney general. So it's not as if Democrats haven't um, uh, seen the Justice Department as an arm of the government. This is not just a Republican problem. But the inherent underlying philosophy and structure is that they're separated. And I just think Trump, for whatever reason, either he doesn't understand it or refuses to act on it. So lock her up is just a small example of a much larger issue, which frankly could come to a head. I mean, we've gotten assurances, you know, indirectly from people in the White House that he has no intention of firing Robert Mueller. But then you have reporting by the New York Times that he was very close to firing Mueller and his own, and his own White House counsel, Donald McGahn, stopped him from doing it. And I think it is, someone asked me, has asked me many times, has President Trump done any, will President Trump be impeached? And I have, my answer is, I don't think he's done anything yet that's impeachable. But is he capable of doing something that's impeachable? I think the answer is yes. I don't think, we'll have to see how the, the Mueller investigation plays out. Is there a case for obstruction of justice there? We don't know enough of the details to make. I'm not a lawyer. Um, it's certainly plausible. But if he were to fire Mueller, if he were to act on, these, on this view that there is no separation, that there's only, that all of these officers, the FBI, federal prosecutors, special counsel, Justice Department, and by the way, I would include that intelligence agencies, which also have a strong history of independence and independent analysis, which he also thinks should be working for him. If he acts on that profoundly misguided understanding of the American system, that could provoke a constitutional crisis. We're not there yet, but we got a long way to go. The press. Yep. What do you think about the press? 90% uh, negative them. reporting. I know. <laughs> but uh, I mean, in general, they, can tw they do tend to give a half of a story. They tend to, I feel, kind of represent maybe the negative of, uh, of any kind of activity or statement. Um, I mean, what's, what's happening with the press? And that's a fair question. I'll try to give you as candid an answer as I can. I think it's a fair question. First of all, the press is a big word, right? You know, and people say the press and then they say, well, MSNBC or Fox News, neither of which I consider independent uh, journalistic uh, operation. Um, they are advocacy in many ways. They are overtly tilted to one form or another. Perfectly legitimate to watch Fox or MSNBC, but you gotta know what you're getting. You know, you can't watch them and say, oh gee, the f they're biased. That's their job, I mean, that's their, brand, right? But when you talk about the mainstream press, which is where I come out of, I'm, I'm really old fashioned about this. I went to work for the New York Times one week out of college. Right? It was like entering the priesthood. Fortunately, it did not involve a vow of either poverty or chastity, but <laughs> it, otherwise it was really like entering the priesthood. And so I'm a very old fashioned guy, this is my values, but I also teach a course, I taught it last night in journalistic ethics at GW. It's a required course because I insist it's a required course. So I take very seriously the, the implication of your, of your question, and, and it's a good question. I think what's happened, to be as candid as I can with you, I think the mainstream press feels that Trump has changed the rules. That for at least three reasons. He's changed the rules because of what I said earlier, that the TBN, which gives him an enormous access directly to 
listeners and viewers and, and, and stakeholders without the filter, the scrutiny, the questioning of the mainstream press. Secondly, every independent fact-checking organization, whether it's Snopes, PolitiFact, Glenn, Glenn Kessler at the Washington Post, whatever, has documented without, without any doubt of his serial fabrications and his failure to apologize for any of them, even when he's called to account. Third, um, the fact that he has repeatedly attacked the press as an enemy. He's called the press the enemy of the people. There was one quote where he says, they're the most you know, hated people in the country. I mean, he has been very vicious in attacks on the press. So you add those three things together, and I do think, it's hard to quantify, it's hard to describe, but I do think the mainstream press, individually and collectively, has made a decision to be tougher on Trump. I think that is true. It, this goes back to a moment, I think it was October of 2016, just before the election. I worked for the New York Times for 25 years. I've read the New York Times for 60 years. And I picked up the paper one morning. I'm one of the few people who actually still reads the paper. And I saw a headline that I had never seen before. And it basically said, Trump lies about birther movement. The word lie was in the headline. And I looked at that and said, I have never seen anything like this before. The next day, the editor of the New York Times, Dean Baquette, was in fact interviewed on NPR by David Folkenflik. And Folkenflik says, is this new? Is this deliberate? And Trump and Baquette said, yes that Trump has changed the rules. And we have to be tougher. We have to be, uh, uh, evaluate uh, his misstatements. We have to be more explicit uh, in, in, in uh, fact-checking and, and counter, uh, uh, countering his, his statements. Now, we can have a long argument about whether that's a good thing or not. Um, I generally think it is, but I think it's very risky because when you say we're going to be that much more aggressive and that much more holding him to account, it is a risky slope. It can easily slide into bias. It can easily slide into partisanship or favoritism. And you've got to be 110% sure that everything you say is 110% correct. And we have already seen mistakes. We have already seen cases where mainstream reporters, in their attempt to act on this new mindset, have gone over a line of fairness. The first day of Trump was in office, famous case, young reporter from Time Magazine named Zeke Miller was part of the press pool. He knew that uh, Barack Obama had displayed a bust of uh, Martin Luther King in his office. He goes into the office with the group of reporters, doesn't see the bust. He doesn't ask anybody. He doesn't check. He doesn't wait. He tweets out immediately, the bust has been removed. Now, we're talking about a pretty incendiary idea, right? I mean, racial issues are the very forefront of, 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 of the controversy around Trump. He was wrong. The bust had been moved. And it was hidden from his view by a Secret Service agent who was standing in front of it. But he was wrong. Now, that kind of mistake is totally unacceptable. That kind of mistake can, can be the, the risk that you take when you say, we're going to be so aggressive in challenging him. If he had followed journalistic norms, if he had waited until he got, could talk to somebody and ask a question, but you're really talking about two things at the same time. This is at the core of, the, of what I teach in this ethics class. Because you have this mindset plus the technology. If that young, per, if that young reporter 20 years ago had noticed the absence of the bust, he couldn't have tweeted it out. He would have had to go back and write a story and face an editor who said, wait, Zeke, are you sure? Zeke, let's call the White House. Zeke, where's your sources, right? Those built-in mechanisms, those built-in speed bumps. Look, we still made mistakes. I'm not here to tell you that the mainstream media is pristine, hardly. But those systems raise the possibility of accuracy and fairness. 
but it's the mindset plus the technology to act on the mindset that's the double whammy. It happened just a few weeks ago. Brian Ross of ABC, very well-known investigative reporter, gets uh, uh, the charges were about to be published against Flynn, right? And so minutes, maybe an hour before the charges become public, he goes on ABC and says that the charges against Flynn include this allegation that the president told Flynn to contact and work with the Russians before he was elected. Now, that was a highly incendiary idea because, first of all, it might well have violated what's called the Logan Act, which is an ancient act which bars individual private citizens from negotiating on behalf of the government. But it also raised starkly the notion of whether, in fact, the Trump campaign had colluded with the Russians during the campaign. If he had instructed Flynn to do this before the election, right? Turns out Ross's source, for whatever reason, was wrong. Charges came out later that day, and it clearly said that Flynn had been asked to contact the Russians after the election, not before the election. Now, again, it's, if you are going to take this highly aggressive and confrontational posture toward the Trump administration, you can't make mistakes like that. You've got to be really, really careful. And the danger, the temptation to want a story to be true whether it's for partisan reasons or because you get a scoop or because your bosses will be pleased, whatever the complex of reasons, it's one of the most dangerous pitfalls a journalist can face, one of the most dangerous ethical pitfalls. So I understand where this, it's an excellent question, I understand where this new mindset is coming from, but it, it, I, it, it bothers me because I think the risks to our credibility are significant. And when you start making mistakes like Zeke Miller and, and, and Brian Ross, all you do is hand Donald Trump ammunition to call you fake news. All, all you do is undermine your own credibility, which is the worst thing we can do. Is that helpful? <laughs> but I guess one of them is, um, where's the effective um, or is there an effective opposition? And, there, and what I'm asking about specifically was your immigration point, but, but generally. So where are the folks who are, and or, are, or are they capable of getting that message out, who can say to um, people, look, immigration is important? I don't see that, I don't see that effectiveness out well, there now. Well, uh, I, I, I do think the message is out there. I think the Dreamers have done a very good job I mean, I'd hire most of them immediately if I was wanted to run a public relations campaign. <laughs> These kids know what they're doing, and they're very effective. Problem is simply numbers. I mean, Chuck Schumer was quoted having privately saying when he basically folded up, you know, they for three days held the government up on this very issue. Viley had to cave in and, 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 and uh, agree to a short-term spending bill. He said, we're holding a pair of fours here, was the way he put it. Our leverage is so limited. Yes, you can filibuster certain issues. You couldn't filibuster the tax bill because of certain congressional rules. But that's a weapon that you can only use occasionally. You can only use very selectively. Um, and, uh, you know, they tried to chuck, cl cl uh, close down the government to force the Republicans to negotiate on, on, on Dreamers, and it didn't work. Now, they got certain promises which still have not been kept. Let's see whether they are going to be kept in the weeks ahead, whether, the, whether uh, McConnell and Ryan will allow legitimate votes on some of these proposals, that's still to be determined. But um, the fact is that Democrats are in a weak position. It, you know, Republicans hold all three key levers of power, the White House, the House, and the Senate. And it's not just the numbers. You got to remember something else when you, you made the implication about publicity. When you have a majority, that means you have the microphone. That means that you're the one who calls committee hearings. That means you're the ones who ask the loudest questions. That means you're the ones who schedule floor debate. That means you're the ones who determine what issues come before the committees. That, th those powers are much vaster than simply the votes up or down. You control the daily flow of information, the daily flow of publicity, the daily agenda 
about con what Congress has considered. So the opposition is left with holding a press conference and hoping people pay attention. And sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. But look, I have enormous sympathy for the dreamers and I have enormous sympathy for many of whom, I mean, I don't know how many Montgomery College has. I talked to Darianne Pollard about it, but it's in the hundreds, I think, of dreamers who attend Montgomery College, let alone the larger population in, 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 in our county. Um, so we have a deep personal vested interest in this issue right here in this, in this county. And I have enormous sympathy for them, but, and they are deeply upset with the Democratic leadership. But I, the fact is, there's just so far the Democrats can go. They just don't have the power. They don't have the leverage. Um, and hopefully enough of a backlash will develop. The Dreamers have been very effective at creating sympathy that something will get passed, but it's going to be hard. And um, as I say, I think in the long run, this is very self-defeating. I mentioned the economic side of it, but there's another way in which it's highly self-defeating to the Republican Party, and that's alienating Hispanic voters. Because if you look at the demographics of this county, let alone of the whole country, it's changing very rapidly. When Ronald Reagan was elected president, the electorate was 88% white. In the last election, it was 71% white. And every election, demographers, and these people have already been born, by the way. Go into any kindergarten in Montgomery County and you will see. <laughs> you know, these people who are going to vote in 10 years have already been born. They're already in our school system. And they are not white kids. Majority of them are not. So, and it's not just Hispanics. In this county, of course, there's a very significant Asian population as well, and that's only growing. African population as well, which is only growing. But if you look at the long-term demographics and the health of the Republican Party, it's nuts. I mean, Lindsey Graham, Republican from South Carolina, has said many times, Republican Party, and that's a direct quote, is facing a demographic death spiral. So it's not just that the party should have a vested self-interest in young immigrants who are paying the bills, it's young immigrants who are voting. And uh, so it is a self-defeating strategy in the long run, but not yet. You know, we, we, we kind of thought it would be dispositive in the last election. I thought Hillary Clinton would be elected in part because of the rising Hispanic vote would be critical in states like Colorado and Nevada, and it turned out not to be that for a whole variety of reasons. But the long-term demographic trend is irreversible and unavoidable. But for now, again, it comes back to something I've said many times already this morning. Republicans are not thinking that way. They're not thinking about the future. They're not thinking about broadening their base. They're thinking about who supports us now and, 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 and appealing to their issues and their prejudices and their instincts, not the people who might vote 10 years from now. Subjects. Yeah, good. Go ahead. Um, North Korea. North will, Korea. Um, the way he talks will put America into a nuclear war. Are we heading that way? No, I don't think so. Uh, first of all, um, I think that there are a lot of uh, tripwires built into the system. Uh, I think the last people in the world who want a nuclear war are the defense <laughs> And a military establishment that surround him. Uh, and I know a whole lot of people who, I, I was ki only half kidding when I say if you are a Democrat, you know, pray for the health of Ruth Ginsburg. The other person you should be praying for the health of is Jim Mattis, uh, the Secretary of Defense, who I know a lot of Republicans who say he's the bulwark against the craziness that can come out of the, out of the White House. So I, I, Maybe I'm naive here, but I, I, no, I don't think we're headed for nuclear war. I don't think either North Korea or the United States wants it. Now, is history re replete with miscalculation that led to war? Sure. Look at World War I. <laughs> it was a perfect example, right? So, uh, but I think that's a little too simple. I do think that there are, uh, the military establishment is the last thing in the world they want is that. I think they can rein them in. And by the way, today, there was this glimmer of accommodation between North and South Korea. The Korean Olympic teams marched into the stadium under one flag today. It happened today, a single flag. 
the president of South Korea greeted the sister of Kim Il Jong, Kim Il Un, um, in his box just a few hours ago in the opening ceremonies of the Olympics. Shook hands with his sister, who was the first North Korean leader to visit the South since the end of the war. So, yeah, there's a lot of bluster, and I, I agree with you to be very concerned about it. But there are these other factors as well. On the Korean Peninsula, of course, they're the ones who are going to be right on the front lines. The last thing South Korea wants is that kind of uh, confrontation. The other wild card here is China. Because as you all know, China is the one entity that has any leverage over North Korea. And um, they've played a very devious game and a very mixed game here. But in the end, it's not in their interest to have a con uh, confrontation on the Korean Peninsula either. So. I don't think you know you can take Trump's bluster as the last or only bit of evidence in this. I think there are a lot of other forces that are working in the opposite direction to hold things back and calm things down. I hope. <laughs> um, so I have another question, another direction, although I have a lot sure. of questions, and it deals with the future, and I don't want to make more out of it as I think the future some is coming. Have. I, the future is coming, and I know people talk about a blue wave, but I don't like to talk about that. Um, I, I want to know your perception if we look at what happened with Virginia, Alabama, what happened with Missouri two days ago. Is there a movement, enough of a movement, that potentially could change in the 2018 layout of the at least the House with enough people participating and running that have never run before that then attracts people as it did in Virginia? Yes. The, an the simple answer is yes. Um, it is definitely a possibility. Is it guaranteed? No. For instance, one figure that many of you have probably taken notice of that caused Democrats to shiver with anxiety just in the last few days, there's a, uh, uh, there's a number that a lot of political pros follow. It's called the generic ballot. When people are asked, would you vote for a Democrat or Republican? Um, a month ago, that ballot was pro-Democrat by 12 or 14 points. It's now shrunk in half. Because so many Democratic votes are wasted, because so many uh, Democrats crowd into a relatively few number of congressional races, that the rule of thumb is the Democrats have to enjoy about a six or seven vote, six or seven percent margin in the generic ballot to be able to win a majority. Now, this is not nefarious. It, it, some of it is gerrymandering, but that's only some of it. Um, a lot of it is self-sorting. You know, Democrats move to big cities. Democrats live in big cities. I mean, this is, there's, a, there's a phrase in the political science literature that's become popular in recent years, the big sort. And, and in many ways, this is becoming worse, this sort of uh, isolation uh, of, of people want to move to where there are like-minded neighbors. And so these... The, the difference between the, the geographical differences are actually getting keener and, 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 and larger. Having said that, um, history is on the side of the Democrats. You all know the basic figures. There have only been two exceptions. They've been fairly recently. One was George Bush. But uh, the, lo the very uh, long-term historic trend has always been that in the first off-year election after a presidential election, the president's party loses seats, can lose a great many seats. Average has been 30. Democrats only need 24, right? Now, there are several reasons for that. One is that inevitably some people are going to be disappointed, right? You know, on the eve of election, people are hopeful. And it happened to Obama, right? It happened to Obama in spades. I mean, he really it was a tremendous fall off of Democratic vote in the midterm elections. There are actually three reasons. One is there's this inevitable uh, fall off. Secondly, um, uh, you have um, uh, the fact that um, uh, when you do have a, a popular president elected, often he will pull in certain marginal members of his own party who can't win on their own in the, in the non-presidential year. Best example of that, well, Reagan pulled in a great many Republicans in 1980. In 82, Democrats picked up 26 seats, even though Reagan himself was still very popular. And in 86... The Democrats took control of the Senate because there have been so many senators elected in 1980 on Reagan's coattails who could not win on their own. 
So there is that pattern. And, 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 and the, the third factor is that, uh, you know, in off years, um, the out party often can be more energetic, can be more um, energized. Um, and that certainly is true today. Um, we saw it virtually the day after Trump's inauguration with the Women's March and the pink hats. I got to tell you, in all honesty, when I looked out at that sea of protesters, my reaction was, where the hell were you two months ago? Yeah, I, I mean, uh, one of the stories of the last few years is that the failure of Clinton as a candidate to generate the enthusiasm and the energy, which was tapped just a few months later, and is still showing itself, because you put your finger on some important points. A lot of what's going to determine the election next fall is happening right now. Who's running? Re candidate recruitment is absolutely critical. In a number of cases, Democrats have recruited some very, in fact, in some districts, almost too many. You know, the Comstock uh, uh, House uh, race across the river, in our, it was one of the chief Democratic targets. There are nine or ten Democrats running for that. They're going to waste a lot of money. They're going to beat each other up, right? So it's almost... It's almost an embarrassment of riches in some of those places. It's also true that um, uh, Democratic campaign contributors seem to be energized. They seem to be ready and willing to give a lot of money. Um, you know, people who sat on their hands for Hillary Clinton now are seeing the consequences. It took almost her loss to, uh, I mean, if you didn't understand the consequences in 2006, you weren't paying attention. But the fact is, for more marginal voters, for all the ways we've been talking about for the last hour and a half, so yes, I do think the Democrats are more energized. I do think they've had a better recruiting year. There are a number of states where Republicans have tried and failed to recruit candidates. You look at North Dakota is a very good example. There's a Democratic senator there, Heidi Heitkamp, a freshman in a state that Trump won by 30, 40 points. And there's one Republican congressman. North Dakota has only one Republican congressman. Everybody wanted him to run for the Senate. He, he declined. A guy named Kramer. So there are a number of states where Republicans have failed to produce. It's happened in Ohio, where Sherrod Brown, the Senate Democratic Senate, up for re-election. Republicans are struggling to find a legitimate candidate to run against him. So there are many signs that it could be a Democratic year. Um, the historic trend is in their favor. Uh, the atmospherics are in their favor. The evidence is in their favor. We've got to win elections on the ground. You know, Hillary Clinton at 4 o'clock in the afternoon of Election Day thought she was going to be president. And so did every single person working in her headquarters, including one former student of mine who was her media director. So you can make a lot of mistakes and make a lot of assumptions. And the worst thing the Democrats can do is to get complacent here, which is exactly what they did in 2016. But I think Trump is a great asset to the Democrats. It's the best thing they have going for them in terms of organization, in terms of mobilization. It's an obvious point, but it's true. He is, he is so feared, you go back to the question about North Korea, and that's only one of a dozen different issues. You know, people are afraid, people are outraged, people are scandalized, and that gets them active in politics. That gets them uh, involved, gets them, opens their wallets. And we'll see what happens. But I think the odds favor a Democratic takeover of the, of the House. But I do not think by any means, because again, you got to look at how much gerrymandering. Republicans were very, very smart 20 years ago in focusing a lot of their political efforts on House, uh, state House and Senate seats. And they took over a great many state legislatures which controlled the redistricting process. And that means that in many states, Democrats have to, they can win a majority, it happened in Pennsylvania. There's been a court case right now, as many of you know, state Supreme Court threw out the, the, the um, map, which is a big boon for Democrats, depending on how the new map is, is, is. Democrats won a majority of votes for House seats in Pennsylvania, and they held five of the 18 seats. But on the raw numbers, they won a majority. Now, again, some of that is self-sorting. There are a whole lot of Democrats in Philadelphia and Pittsburgh whose votes are wasted. But it's also true that Republicans maximized the, the, the uh, benefits of, of power. So that's going to be one of the firewalls against the Democrats because it's going to run up against these redistricting 
Some of these have been uh, like in Pennsylvania, but others that have been challenged in the courts are not going to be redrawn for the 2018 election, North Carolina being a good example. So it's a mixed bag there. Uh, when I was at GW almost 50 years ago, one of the best courses I took my last year was a two-course arc on U.S. diplomatic history. Mm -hmm. And could, one of the hidden secrets of the first year of Trump is what's going on at the State Department. Right. Uh, and could you talk about that? Because we're, we're not filling ambassadorships. We're losing 28 to 30 percent of their budget. And many people, I guess, want, would rather have diplomacy than war. And that seems to be one of the hidden secrets of the first year of the Trump administration. I agree with you on that. I, it's not an area of my great expertise. But you're right, there's been a tremendous um, outflow of seasoned diplomats. Some have been forced out, some have quit because they, you know, just out of frustration. It's not just in the State Department, by the way. One of the underlying themes of the Trump administration has been to declare war on professionals of all kinds. So you're talking about intelligence officers, you're talking about climate scientists, you're talking about medical officers at the Centers for Disease Control. You're talking about a whole, you're talking about economists, accountants, a whole range of professionals. If you're a professional, and it, I'm, I assume there are a number of people in this room who spent your lives as professionals in government service, maybe your kids or grandkids do. I'm, this is our community, this is our world, right? We all know people who have, who, who, who have done this, uh, dedicated their lives to, to this service. And what's the, the, the core value is, that as a professional, you operate by professional standards. And that means that you're independent of partisan influence. If you're a government scientist, you do science. You don't do politics. If you're a government economist, you do economics. You don't do partisan politics. And that has been one of the lures for generations into government services, that this is, the enterprise is nonpartisan. It spans, uh, it's a career. It spans administrations. And your job is to produce quality information for the, you don't dictate policy, but you serve policymakers with impeccable professional information produced by professional standards. So the outflow from the State Department is a symptom of a much larger problem, which is the lack of respect for professionalism, a lack of respect for the notion that there's even such a thing as independent facts. Everybody, you know, lampoons Kellyanne Conway alternative facts, but the truth is that statement was at the core of Trump's worldview. That was an accurate reflection of how he views the world, which is that I get to decide what the facts are. And when photographs show huge gaps in attendance at his inaugural, he just refuses to acknowledge the facts as they exist there. But it's not just enough refusing to acknowledge the facts. It's the undermining of professionalism. I'm sure everybody in this room has a personal story, you know, a neighbor, a friend, a cousin, a, a grandchild, you know, and, it's, and it goes across the board of, of government professions, as I say, not just diplomats. Now, I think it's worse in the State Department because it's more visible. Um, Trump has uh, derided not just the notion of professionalism, but the notion of diplomacy in general. Uh, he's derided the notion of the value of international alliances. You know, America first is, is, is almost a clarion call to deride and undermine diplomacy. Because at the very heart of diplomacy is the notion of mutual advantage and negotiation and finding a common value that you can, I mean, nation states of course operate in their own national self-interest. That would be foolish to pretend otherwise. The whole underlying philosophy, the whole underlying value of diplomacy is a conviction that negotiation can bridge those gaps in national self-interest to find common interests, right? That's the essence of diplomacy. And whether it's in the area of trade, which is perhaps the most telling, or whether it's the area of NATO, which he has repeatedly derided, um, you have a, uh, a persistent um, undermining of the very nature of diplomacy. So if you've given your life to that world and those set of values, it's a pretty uncomfortable place. I mean, because your whole professional life is questioned. Your whole professional value system is questioned. So you're absolutely right about that. And, and it's also recruitment. 
you know, I think you're going to, you, the pipeline's going to dry up. So, you know, a lot of people leave and then you don't replenish them. Uh, I think there's also one other subtext here, which is Trump's been very slow to fill a lot of positions in the government, not just in the State Department. And I think there are two reasons for that. One is, and this is an oversimplification, but I think it has a lot of validity. If you define the basic difference between democratic and republican philosophies as they've existed over recent generations, the single biggest defining difference is attitudes toward government. Democrats tend to have a much more favorable attitude toward government than Republicans. They have, tend to have the view that, Demo that government can operate in good and benign ways for the welfare of the, of, of the populace. You know, I was listening to a Republican conservative on the air this morning on NPR, and all he said is, all we want to do is make the government smaller. There's a, a profound basic difference in the, value, in, the, in the value of government service. So Democrats flock to government service because they believe in government. One of the reasons why he's had trouble filling a lot of these posts, just, not just because Trump personally, but it's always true of Republican administrations, because um, you get f far fewer people who want to go into government service because they believe less in the value of government. Now, Ronald Reagan turned that around a little bit because Ronald Reagan turned reducing the size of government into a noble crusade. And so there are a lot of young conservatives drawn into the Reagan years by this crusade to reduce the size of government, which of course didn't happen. So there's a lot of complicating factors there, but you're certainly right about it. Um, and uh, even more than diplomacy, well, the, one of the key areas is trade. Because at its very heart, trade is a complex series of negotiations of reconciling conflicting values and national interests. And he's just sort of, at least for now, basically thrown up his hands on the whole value of, of certainly a multilateral trade deal. So there's some talk about individual trade deals. So yeah, I, your point is very well taken, and it is happening. You're right about it. What do you think it would take for the Republican leadership, McConnell and, and Ryan, uh, to oppose some of Trump's attacks on institutions such as Department of Justice mm -hmm. and the FBI? It's an excellent question. Yeah, for those of you who didn't hear it, what would it take for people like Paul Ryan to turn against Trump's attacks on institutions to, in other words, follow the lead of Jeff Flake and, to some extent, Bob Corker, right? Both of whom, of course, as you know, are Republican senators who were not running against. Uh, and therefore, and, or John McCain, who is fatally ill and uh, totally liberated from, uh, uh, from uh, political considerations. But you get past those three, and the, the courage factor drops pretty sharply. Um, look, I think that the Paul Ryans of the world, some of it is cynical and some of it is practical. From a practical point of view, if you are Paul Ryan or you are any Republican, whatever else you might think about Donald Trump, he still is the person who signs bills. And whatever else you might think about Donald Trump, he is the one who has the ability to help you enact the programs that you have fought for for a long time, starting with tax reform. I mean, this has been a Republican cardinal principle for a long time. And so there is a lot of incentive to swallow your doubts about Trump's character, Trump's veracity, Trump's uh, all of those, because in the end, they got what they wanted because Trump was the president. So their self-interest, first in terms of substance of policy, is inevitably intertwined with Trump. Secondly, their political self-interest is intertwined with Trump because even Republicans who break with Trump, there's going to be an R after their name on the ballot next year. And so, like it or not, they, their political interest is tied up with Trump. Now, in some marginal districts, you'll see some separation, right? Um, uh, in certain states where, uh, uh, where uh, you got Republicans who were elected in districts where Clinton won. There aren't that many of them, but there are some. So you'll see out of self-interest some Republicans breaking with Trump. But the large majority, for better or worse, whether they want to or not, they can't avoid it. Their political interests and their policy interests are tied up with Trump. So the truth is that 
they don't have much incentive to break with Trump unless they just can't stand it. And you have some who have been outspoken like Flake and, um, uh, and Corker. You have some who have sort of more quietly decided not to run again, uh, but not made a big public uh, sign of displeasure. A good example of that is a guy named Rodney Freelingheisen, a congressman, progressive Republican from New Jersey. Chairman of the Appropriations Committee is not running again. And that's partly because he's in New Jersey, a very democratic state. He's likely to face a very tough re-election race. But, you know, he's an anti-Trumper. He hasn't made a big deal of it, so he's just sort of quietly said, you know, I'm leaving. But, you know, I, I think it's possible that in the long run, history will treat the Paul Ryans of the world badly. I think history will make a judgment. We, there's so much that's not known yet. You know, we're still only a year after Trump. Um, but I think there's a growing possibility that Trump will be Nixon, that whoever works for Trump will be forever tainted by the record of the administration. Now, I say that sadly, in a way, because I'm also an American. I, I, I want people to believe in their government. I want people to have confidence in their president. I want people to respect their president. I have a bunch of former students who worked for the Trump administration. I originally counseled them to do it because I thought serving your country is an honorable thing to do. And the chance to work in a White House is a chance of a lifetime if you care about these issues as my students do. I'm now beginning to think I might have given them a bump steer. <laughs> but I don't, I'm still uncertain about that. So much needs to play out here. But, um, you know, Mitch McConnell and, Don, and Donald Trump and Paul Ryan are, whether they like it or not, they are wedded at the hip. And to expect them to show moral courage is expecting too much, probably. Congress and the president have decided to ignore uh, the fact that the Russians intruded on our last election. Uh, the only Not thing, all of Congress, just the Republicans in Congress. Uh, <laughs> uh, the only thing I've seen recently is the head of Homeland Security who suggests the states need to get their act together, mm -hmm. which is a, certainly a clever fix. Uh, your comments? Well, as I say, I, I, I think that... Um, it's not entirely true. I think the, the big problem is that, that so much of the effort to find an independent evaluation of what the Russians really did and what the consequences could be in the future, it's tied up with so many of the things I've already said, right? It's tied up with loyalty to Trump personally, so that Republicans don't want to admit the f possibility that the election was tainted. Uh, Trump's ego is so titanic that we know that any hint that his election was less than totally valid drives him totally berserk. Um, we know that um, uh, the investigation by Mueller has the effect in many ways of pulling Republicans closer together. It's sort of a circling the wagons view. We know, going back to my answer to the gentleman in the green sweater, that the Mueller investigation as an independent search for facts runs it to some of the same doubts that I was talking about in terms of diplomacy or economics or climate science. It's, it, you can see in the attacks just recently, you know, dredging up, you know, the, the, trying to find any shred of evidence that the investigation is illegitimate. The whole controversy over the dossier, which even Republicans said didn't have anything to do with the Mueller investigation, but it was used to try to cast doubt on the validity of an independent investigation. You've seen it now with the emails between those two um, uh, lovesick uh, FBI agents who, you know, tweeted inappropriate and, and undisciplined things um, to each other, emailed to each other. And of course, again, handing Republicans ammunition to discredit um, the investigation. So, um, you know, um, there are many factors working to undermine an appreciation of an independent investigation here because it's all been tied up 
in partisanship. It's all been tied up in tr Trump loyalty to Trump personally. It's all been tied up in this notion of can you really have an independent, bipartisan investigation of the facts? The whole campaign against Mueller is rooted in the notion that there's no such thing. That even Robert Mueller, of all people, the most rock-ribbed man of the highest independence, is just a partisan creature, even the fact that, aside of course the fact that he's a Republican. And all of the people that Trump is attacking, whether it's Rosenstein or Sessions or Christopher Wray, he appointed them all. But because they pose an independent source of authority or contradiction to him, he's trying to undermine them. So I do think that in the end, however, that um, there will be a significant accounting here. I think Mueller, you know, Trump might try to fire him, but I don't think it, the explosion would be, you know, Lindsey Graham said the other day, if you try to fire him, it would be the end of the Trump presidency. So the odds are that there will be an accounting. The odds are there will be a report. The odds are there will be an independent finding by the special counsel, at least on one element of this, which is to what extent Trump collaborated with the Russians. Now, I think the implication of your question is that it goes far beyond that. There are many ways in which the Russians try to meddle with the election, which had nothing to do with Trump. You know, the hacking of political systems, the, you know, the uh, manipulation of Facebook, and so many other factors. So whatever Mueller comes up with will only be a piece of the story. Um, but I, I think there will be other sources of information. One of the most interesting transformations that's taking place is Facebook. If you go back and look a year or a year and a half ago, and Mark Zuckerberg talked about Facebook as an institution. He said, and I quote pretty directly, we are not a media company said that quite flatly and directly. In effect, he was saying, we're like the telephone company. We're simply a common carrier that transmits other people's information, and we play no role in editing, filtering, evaluating, scrutinizing that information. That, of course, is ridiculous. And he has been forced over the last year, year and a half, to admit that it's ridiculous, and that Facebook, in effect, is the largest publisher in the world, with enormous editorial responsibilities um, in terms of the use and misuse of those platforms. So one of the moving parts here is from these institutions themselves, Facebook, Google. Um, do they, uh, are they energized to police themselves? Are they energized to change their systems to try to combat um, these kind of outside uh, influence? I think the answer is yes. Now, they're moving slowly because, as I say, you know, a year ago he was denying it was even a problem. But he can't do that anymore, and he doesn't anymore. So there are many pieces to this. It's not just one thing. There are many pieces to it. And I think the answer will come out piecemeal. Mueller will provide one piece. Zuckerberg will provide another piece. Independent uh, investigators of other kinds will fill in the blanks. So I, it won't be neat and clean, but I do think over a period of time we'll learn a lot, a lot more than we know now. You sort of touched on this. I just finished reading um, Dark Money, and I was wondering if you'd comment about um, Citizens United and the growing effectiveness of the conservatives in using PACs to, um, to affect uh, the state uh, and local elections, as well mm -hmm. as um, putting out effective um, and deceptive media ads and infiltrating universities with the uh, professorships. Well, uh, they have a, got a long way to go to infiltrate universities, <laughs> um, uh, given the huge preponderance of liberal voices. <laughs> Believe me, I teach in a university, I can validate that. But look, it's a fair question. I think what happened interestingly enough, is some years ago. I trace it back to Reagan. You know, before Reagan, there used to be this cliche in Washington that, you know, everything in Washington was liberal, all the think tanks, all of the institutions were liberal. And there was some truth to that. Reagan changed the landscape in Washington in a basic way. I alluded to it earlier. He made conservatism much more compelling. Now, beforehand, the conservatism was people like Robert Taft, 
you were not exactly appealing or dynamic, certainly to young people. Ronald Reagan was his generation's version of Jack Kennedy in many ways. Ronald Reagan was the most magnetic and indelible figure of his age in American politics. Well, you agree with me or not, I'm just trying to describe, right? And so many conservatives, on many levels in many different ways, uh, were attracted to the world of Washington and the world of public policy and trying to influence it and trying to shape it through Reagan. He drew them in, in the same way that Jack Kennedy drew my generation of Democrats and liberals. My, my college career totally spanned the Kennedy presidency. He was elected the fall of my freshman year and killed the fall of my senior year. And compounded by the fact that I was at Harvard meant that a high percentage of my classmates were indelibly marked by the influence of Jack Kennedy. And they became public interest lawyers, and they became public health doctors, and all sorts of things. And I became a journalist, my version of public service. Now, if you fast forward to the Reagan years, you have uh, uh, the growth of uh, conservatism as a much more appealing, dynamic philosophy to a lot of young people who were drawn to Washington, drawn to the world of Reagan. And you had uh, a lot of conservative interests, big money interests, energized by Reagan to get involved in the public policy process. And that's where you got the growth of institutions like the Heritage Foundation, the Cato Institute, the American Enterprise Institute, and countless, the Federalist Society, which I mentioned earlier, and countless other institutions well-funded by newly active conservatives to influence public policy. So there is nothing new about the Koch brothers. This has been going on for a generation. And um, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, forces uh, are not only very wealthy, but were newly energized to contribute money to institutions that could influence the public policy process. And so uh, you mentioned, that, you know, the, so Citizens United accelerated this trend and made and loosened some of the rules, but the impulse has been there much longer before Citizens United. It didn't start with Citizens United. Cato Institute has been there, you know, for 40 years. So um, I see this as the fruition of Reaganism in some ways. Uh, and um, there's no doubt that Citizens United made it much easier for these um, forces to influence policy because the limits on their contributions have been largely torn away. Uh, and so you do have examples like the Koch brothers. And of course, let's remember the Koch brothers, don't, all of these conservatives don't always agree. There are a lot of conservatives who got in this business because they really did believe in smaller government. There are a lot of conservatives around town gasping in horror at this bill that was passed yesterday, right? It's not as if there's a con necessarily a consistency. Um, but the bottom line is true. The bottom line is true that conservatives have, to their credit in a way, have figured out the system, have energized, have put their money where their mouth is, um, and it has been an important factor in uh, sort of recalibrating the political power and the political forces in America. Um, I mentioned the Federalist Society is a very good example. The day Ronald Reagan, uh, the day uh, Donald Trump was president, there was a list of 20, 30 young potential jurists that was handed to him, literally, on the day he came into office. That didn't happen by accident. That happened because there was a well-funded operation for years that was aimed at exactly that moment of vetting, approving, uh, supporting, fostering young conservatives to take these judicial positions. So. It's, it's the, another the equivalent is the way the Republicans focus so much on state legislature races, which had the enormously beneficial effect from their point of view of controlling the legislature. So part of what the bottom line here is, whatever you might think of Citizens United, and clearly you don't think much of it, and that's fair enough, but it is the rule now. So are the Democrats going to throw up their hands and bemoan the fact that, the, you know, or are they going to play by the new rules and, and get in the game? And so, you know, the truth is, in many of these strategic decisions over the last generation, Republicans have 
out-strategized Democrats and out-thought Democrats and out-funded Democrats, which is one of the reasons why the Republicans control the, the presidency of the House and the Senate. Uh, in the face of the fact that there's no doubt that a majority of Americans are Democrats. The difference has been that organization. The difference has been the planning. The difference has been the concentration of resources. The difference has been the recruitment. The difference has been you know, the fostering of, 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 of uh, farm teams in the state legislatures. I mean, there's a whole series of factors. The bottom line is Democrats have to get in the same game.